is our first year at the public library, which is great, especially given the massive interest in tonight's event. I'm speaking to not around, but exactly 800 people right now, since that was the amount of, or number of people that were coming. And on behalf of Awning, a warm welcome to each and every one of you. I know that many of you have traveled from Copenhagen and other parts of Sweden, so an extra thanks uh, to you for joining us here now and tonight. For the non-Swedish part of the audience, I should probably add that on means in English, an in German, Adense in Danish. And this clue might be what psychoanalysis is all about. A clue, an on in that something or someone is of immense importance without knowing what that is, what it means, not to mention what to do with it. Tonight we've gathered to dwell upon questions of how to deal with gender, but before that I have a bunch of stuff here that I have to get rid of. And in order to do so, I would like to ask Anders Lindström to join me here on stage. And uh, while he made his way up here, it didn't take very long, so he... I could tell you that Anders is not only the, one of the founding members of our association, he is the member that has carried on in throughout the previous 12 years and worked relentlessly to make all this possible. As the t-shirt that we have been printed says, Anders is on a <laughs> manically checking my email while doing so. I realized that Butler had responded and accepted to participate in two events one in Copenhagen on grief, and one in Melna on gender. As we move into 2020 and our planning of these events intensified, the party turned out to be over before it got started. If the pandemic allows, was Butler's response to one of the suggestions in a later email. And as you all know, the pandemic didn't allow for very much at all, and so we had to wait until today, May 3rd, 2023, for this to happen. Judith Butler is probably far beyond the need of introduction in this setting, but still, a few words on why we are extra delighted to welcome you here in Melbourne. And this is going to be the last personal episode for today, of course. <laughs> Growing up in a tiny industrial town in Badenland, I recall an early memory of visiting our public library. It wasn't quite as magnificent as this one, but there was a library. What I recall specifically was a small exhibition about the town of Forshagas, two sister cities or twin towns, one located in Estonia and the other somewhere in southern Germany. Long before new materialism, I remember thinking that it was puzzling how cities could be friends with one another. Preparing this introduction, I recall this episode thinking that if cities could have twin philosophers instead of twin cities, Butler would be Melmus first choice. <laughs> what I think the atmosphere in Melbourne and the number of people who have shown up today testifies to me is that your writing students and your way of doing and living philosophy means a lot to many of the people in the city. In a discussion with Simon Critchley following the publication of one of Butler's most recent books, The Force of Nonviolence from 2020 at the People's Forum in New York City, Butler is talking about how an effective struggle against fascism might look like, when suddenly making the remark that whatever it might be, it ought to include, quote, 
the non-gender among us. All of a sudden, they said, there was a non-binary box to tick off in the paperwork sent out by the state of California. To which Butler remarks, quote, that box had been waiting for me, or maybe I helped to make that box. What do I know? End of quote. <laughs> Critchley absolutely agrees, but doesn't quite know what to say or how to respond, which doesn't happen very often. <clears throat> Sooner or later, philosophy tends to trickle down into the world and become history. Still, the process through which thought becomes politics and politics becomes life is long, bumpy, and often takes 200 years or more. When Butler published Gender Trouble in 1990, it ignited a new way of thinking about sex and gender that blazed not only across global academia, but out on the streets and into the homes and bodies of millions of people around the world. When Butler published Precarious Life in 2004 and Frames of War in 2009, it offered us key intellectual and political resources to grasp what just happened in the aftermath of 9-11. Few of Butler's books forget to mention the conflict that most others have become so accustomed to that we seem to think that it's written in the DNA of the world, the conflict between Israel and Palestine. Indeed, Butler's thinking often begins in disaster and suffering. And what happens in many of these situations, be that the mistreatment of sexual and gender minorities, the war on terror, or everyday life at the Gaza Strip, is that people get expelled from the prospect of being born. Tomorrow, Butler will be giving a lecture on climate sorrow at the University of Copenhagen. And as readers of Butler will know, grief, mourning, and melancholy play a key role in their thoughts from the very beginning. Grief would not be grief without the vulnerability that runs through the waves of Butler's writings. Importantly, this is not vulnerability as an identity category or an individual property, but vulnerability as a feature of social relations. For Butler, people, persons, individuals, human beings, subjects, call them whatever you like, are not self-sufficient entities. We are, in Butler's own words, from the very beginning, given over to the world of others, undone by each other. Even though these others can let us down, and this world is one of war, destruction, and violence, it is also a world of love, care, and recognizability. It was, Butler writes in a 1999 foreword, Gender Trouble, <laughs> referring back to the writing of that same book. It was done from a desire to live. It was done from a desire to live, to make life possible, and to rethink the possible as such. End of quote. Butler's entire work might be read as one striking argument in favor of the fact that there is no natural way for us to be. And even though this causes immense confusion, this line of thought is likewise pregnant with possibility. To make life possible and to rethink the possible as such. Butler's contribution to the field of gender studies has been one rather effective way of opening up the range of possibilities for being and living otherwise. And in tonight's lecture, Butler will be talking about some of the more hostile reactions to that opening. Before giving the word to Judith and their lecture of Separate of Gender, I would like to extend our thanks to, first of all, the public library here in Melbourne, the Deca especially, for letting us use this building. The room we are in tonight is called the Usage Calendar in Swedish. The Calendar of Lights would be a fair translation. Second, I would like to thank ONING's collaborating organizations, Folk University at Psychotherapy Centrum, and the Bethany the Land Boys Stiftelse for generous support. Thirdly, and specific for this event, which has been co-hosted with the Center for Applied Ecological Thinking at the University of Copenhagen, I would like to thank Nikke Hauser-Fansen and Stefan Gorsman Jakobs. On the side of practicalities, I can inform you that Butler will be speaking for about 30 minutes, and following the lecture, Sara Edenheim and Shlopa Björklind will join us on stage for a panel. With that, please welcome Judith Butler.
all for your warm and overwhelming welcome. Um, I am very pleased to be here. Uh, I would like first to thank my hosts and all those who made this visit possible, uh, especially Alfred Schuld, the panelists for today, uh, Sora Imheim and Charlotte Bjorklind, um, Anders Lindstrom, thank you as well, the Malmö, Malmö Public Library staff, especially Rebecca. Uh, all of these people have made this event uh, possible. And of course, Onyin, the Association of Philosophy and Psychoanalysis. In English, at least, gender has not been a controversial term until very recently. But now, there, and in various parts of the world, gender is not only figured as an omen of potential or actual child abuse, but also a plot by urban elites to impose their cultural values on poor people, even a scheme for colonizing the global south by the urban centers of the global north. Sometimes it is figured as a set of ideas that threaten the facts of science, or the truths of religion, or both. And other times it is a threat to civilization, a denial of nature, a threat to masculinity, or the effacement of the differences between the sexes. It is also sometimes regarded as a totalitarian movement aligned with the pedagogy of indoctrination, but sometimes the work of the devil understood either as the demonic itself or its contemporary instance. Some claim that it is, like nuclear warfare, the most destructive force unleashed upon the earth, or the contemporary and dangerous rival to God, trying to usurp divine powers of creation, and as such, must be countered at all costs. Gender is no longer a mundane box to be checked on official forms, and surely not one of those obscure academic disciplines with no promising effect on the world. On the contrary, it is now a phantasm, possibly unleashed by universities endowed with destructive powers. Thus, it becomes one way of collecting and escalating a multitude of fears about destruction circulating in our time. Now, of course, there are many reasons to fear destruction. Femicide, systemic racism, neoliberal economies have supplanted social democracies, and they are depriving people of basic social services they need to live and thrive. Systemic racism takes the lives of many through both slow and quick forms of violence, and women, queer, and trans people, especially those who are black and brown, are murdered in many parts of the world at appalling rates. On the right, however, the list of the powers of destruction is different. Challenges to patriarchal power and social structures in the state, civil society, religion, and kinship, migration that challenges traditional ideas of the nation, as well as white supremacy and Christian nationalism. <clears throat> Their list goes on, but no list can explain how fears of destruction are exploited by various movements, institutions, and states, and how gender, or the teaching about systemic racism, for that matter, are blamed for the acute sense of peril that many people now live with. For gender to be identified as a threat to life, civilization, society, the nation, for it to be the effect of hypercapitalism and totalitarianism at the same time, colonization and decolonial resistance at the same time, it has to gather up a diverse array of fears and anxieties, package them into a single bundle, subsume them under a single name, and invest them 
with ultimate destructive powers. As Freud taught us about dreams, whatever is happening in phantasms such as these involves the condensation of a number of elements and a displacement from what does not want to be seen or named. I will return to condensation and displacement in a moment. Can we even say how many contemporary fears gather at the site of gender? Or explain how the demonization of gender deflects from and covers over fears about climate destruction, intensified economic precarity, or environmental toxins that may breed police violence. Fears we are surely right to feel and to think about. Can we say why some of those fears collect at the site of gender? When gender becomes a phantasm for the contemporary right, the various conditions that give rise to those fears lose their name. Gender collects and incites those fears, keeping us from thinking more clearly about what we actually do have to fear and what we do not. Circulating the phantasm of gender is also one way for existing powers states, churches, political movements, to frighten people into joining their ranks or rejoining their ranks, to accept censorship and to externalize their fear and hatred onto vulnerable communities. They not only appeal to existing fears that many working people have about the future of work or the sanctity of their family life, but they seize upon and incite those fears insisting that people identify gender as the cause of their feelings of anxiety and trepidation about the future of the world, or rather, the future of their world. You understand me? I'm not hopelessly complex. I'm not a radical obscurantist. Okay, because I, I, I want to be speaking you and I want to be connected to you. So you let me know if it's not happening. <laughs> well, let me know later if it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Consider the incitation of Pope Francis in 2015, and he's supposed to be the better one. <laughs> After warning of the existence of Herod's, Herod, in every historical period, he remarks that gender theory consists of contemporary Herodians who, if I quote, plot designs of death that disfigure the face of man and woman, destroying creation, end quote. He then makes clear just how annihilating the force of gender theory is, and I quote, Let's think of the nuclear arms, of the possibility to annihilate in a few instances a very high number of human beings. Let's also think of genetic manipulation, of the manipulation of life, or of the gender theory that does not recognize the order of creation, end quote. Pope Francis continues with the story about how funding for education for schools serving the poor was provisioned only on the condition that gender theory be included in the curriculum, and he's very upset about this. We're never given any details about what gender theory might be, but it clearly should be feared as one would fear the massive loss of life. To require the teaching of gender in schools is, in his words, ideological colonization. He adds, and I quote, the same was done by the dictators of the last century. Think of Hitler, you, end quote. I mean, maybe he's some people's friends, but he's not my friend. <laughs> In fact, the term gender oscillates between the ordinary and the catastrophic, as I've just detailed, depending on where one lives and how recently the term came into use. And whether it has been construed as a dangerous phantasm by those who seek to preserve patriarchal forms of family and state. One increasingly publicized fear in several parts of the world 
is that certain academic fields of study or certain educational institutions have become modes of left-wing indoctrination. Gender studies is sometimes characterized as a dangerous ideology inflicted on apparently susceptible, vulnerable students from grade school to college and university. The youth need to be protected from gender, it appears. In a frenzy of recent Republican legislative efforts in the United States, epitomized by Wyoming and Florida, teaching about gender is variously said to be ideological inculcation, erotic seduction, and or <coughs> pedophilia. It is also seen in the US and beyond, certainly in Brazil, in Chile, <coughs> in Argentina, as a plot by urban elites to impose their cultural values on real people, a form of colonization by superpowers, or sometimes an invasion of an unwanted migrant from poor or war-inflicted countries. Um, um, okay. And as I have said, it is also a challenge to both science and religion, civilization, nature, masculinity, differences between the sexes, the end to names like mother and father. As a demon or as a devil, it is also a bomb, a game of fascists, movement toward totalitarianism, the destruction of spiritual values, the most destructive force unleashed upon the earth, the contemporary rival to God that must be destroyed for life to prevail. Obviously, the Vatican's decision to consider gender as a nuclear bomb not only figures the study of gender or the existence of public policy on gender as impossibly destructive, but it engages in some destructive activity of its own. The influence of the Vatican and the generally high esteem in which Pope Francis has been held means that people do listen to his views to find moral guidance and they consequently feel a heightened sense of fear in relation to the threat he describes. If gender is a nuclear bomb, it has to be dismantled. If it is the devil itself, all those who represent gender must be expelled from humanity to save humanity and God's creation. Although what he says is preposterous and very dangerous, that hardly matters given the power of the claims to incite, sustain, and direct fears about destruction. Gender has assumed a startling number of phantasmatic forms, eclipsing both the academic and ordinary usage of the term. As a consequence, circulating the idea of gender's destructive powers is one way to produce existential fear that can be exploited by those who want greater state powers to fulfill the promise of a return to a patriarchal order that will reestablish security. That fear is stoked so that authorities who promise its alleviation can enter as forces of redemption and restoration, paternal authorities, and to protect the people. The fear at issue is we might say discovered, amplified, and exploited in order to rally people to support those who would destroy the concept of gender, the field of study, as well as the social movements and public policies organized with the term or through the term. Clearly, the anti-gender ideology movement is reactive, incited by new policies and laws that guarantee lesbian and gay rights of marriage and parenting, trans rights to self-identify, new forms of sex education that let young people know about the range of human sexuality, as well as the basic requirements of consent, equality, and ethics, the right to abortion, but also greater claims to reproductive justice are increasingly, increasingly accepted in most countries, not mine, and laws against sexual violence Sexual harassment have become part of the Istanbul Convention and other such international agreements for some time. As anti-discrimination laws and policies have become codified in the European Union and other forms of transnational governance, both nationalist and right-wing populist reactions have been stoked in the name of the nation, gender and gender equality is opposed in the name of both nation and religion, 
laws against marital rape are opposed. So we could, as many have done, simply conclude that we're seeing a backlash because of the legislative and policy victories for feminism and LGBTQIA plus people. Yes, the aim of the anti-gender movements is to roll back progressive legislation. That's a kind of backlash. But backlash only describes the reactive moment in this scene. I suggest that what we have before us is a project of restoration that promises a return to a patriarchal dream order that may never have existed, but which is on offer under the name of history that must be restored or put forward as a nature that must be recovered. Um, in order, an order, an order, uh, which only a strong state can restore. This restoration fantasy shores up state powers, including the powers of the courts, and situates the anti-gender ideology movement within a larger authoritarian project. At the same time, by targeting sexual and gender minorities as dangerous to society, even the most destructive forces in the world, States build a rationale to strip them of their fundamental rights and freedoms, including their protection from harassment and violence and death. All this implicates the anti-gender ideology movement in fascist passion. For full license is given to the state to negate the lives of those who have come to represent, through the workings of this phantasm, a threat to the nation. I will turn in a moment to this key question. How has gender become a phantasm of this kind? <clears throat> In taking aim at gender, some proponents of the anti-gender movements claim to be defending not just family values, but values themselves, not just a way of life, but life itself. Figured as the force of death, gender must be opposed in the name of life, life, young life, the reproductive future of life. The phantasm that fuels fascist tendencies is one that seeks to totalize the social field and infuse the populace with fear about its existential future, the future of their life, or rather, the gender phantasm operates to collect and exploit its existing fears through giving a totalizing form to its cause. It would be tempting to say that gender, oh, it seems like gender has become an empty signifier because it no longer refers to anything we might understand as gender, or because it now attracts and mobilizes fears from several orders in society, including the economic and the ecological. But gender is less an empty signifier than an overdetermined one, bearing a number of accretions from social history and political discourse. Gender designates, even in the popular imagination, I would say, in the broadest sense, gender designates some way of living the body, so life and the body are its topics, zones of passion and fear, as well of hunger and illness, vulnerability, penetrability, relationality, sexuality, and violence. If the life of the body, the distinct or differentiated life of the body is already under the best of conditions, a site where sexual anxieties cluster, where social norms take up residence, then all the sexual and social struggles in life find a location and incitement precisely there. As much as gender is about so much more than gender in the anti-gender ideology movement, so gender is very much about the senses of embodied life formed and framed by social conventions and psychic disturbance. To be told, as Italian Prime Minister Giorgio Meloni has told the Italian and Spanish publics, that the advocates of gender will strip you of your sex identity, stokes fear and outrage among those whose sex identity is fundamental to their very sense of who they are. 
to exploit that manufactured fear for the purposes of stripping trans people of their rights of self-determination is to mobilize the fear of having one's sexed identity nullify in order to nullify the sexed identities of others. Very clever. The very fear of being deprived of something so intimate and defining as a sexed identity depends on a general understanding that this would be, in fact, a deprivation. According to Meloni's logic, it would then be wrong to deprive anyone of the sexed aspect of their very being. And from this premises, it should be possible to universalize the claim and to refuse to engage in any activity that would deprive anyone of their sexed identity, including trans people. But the opposite has proven to be true when the right to my own sex requires that you lose yours. She's claiming that trans people are doing that to cis people, but she's rallying cis people to do that to trans people. The logic she uses to defend a conception of natal sex, sex assigned at birth, cannot be generalized. And yet, tacitly, she gives us the very moral argument we need to defeat her call. Logic, however, appears in ephemeral forms. <laughs> and the rejoinder to positions such as these cannot assume rational persuasion will be sufficient. Reason is both interrupted and mobilized by other sorts of passions operating according to different kinds of logics. The task is to try to understand such an accelerated inflation and bundling of potential dangers and to ask, how can we possibly counter a phantasm of this size and intensity before it moves yet closer to eradicating reproductive justice, the rights of women, trans and non-binary people, gay and lesbian freedoms, and all efforts to achieve gender and sexual equality and justice, before it joins the frenzy of censorship targeting critical race theory, post-colonial studies, and ethnic studies, to name a few. Yes, we could provide very good arguments about why looking at gender this way is wrong, right? And I could have come and simply rebutted their views. And that would be useful for educators and policymakers who seek to, seek to explain why they retain the term and find it valuable. I hope somebody does that work. I mean, maybe I'll do it myself. We could also try to give a history that accounts for how gender came to be looked at in this way, paying attention to both its secular and religious versions, noting how right-wing Catholics and evangelicals overcame some of their differences in their battle against this common enemy. All of these approaches are surely necessary, but they can hardly account for or counter the phantasmatic force of gender. This phantasm, understood as a psychosocial phenomenon, is a site where intimate fears and anxieties become socially organized to incite political passions. What's the structure of this vibrant and distorted phantasm called gender? And by what aim is it animated? And how do we develop a counter-imaginary strong enough to expose its roots, scatter its force, and stop the efforts at censorship, distortion, and reactionary politics? In addition, it is up to us to produce a compelling counter-vision, one that would affirm the rights and freedoms of embodied life that we can and should affirm. For in the end, it is a matter of affirming how one loves, how one lives one's body, the right to exist in the world without fear of violence or discrimination, to breathe, to move, to breathe again, to move again as an embodied person one is and wishes to be, and to form passionate relations with a heart more open than seized with fear, of censorship, violence, imprisonment, or pathologization. Why wouldn't we all want people to have those fundamental freedoms? If one's opponents are gripped with fear, overwhelmed by the threat of a dangerous phantasm, then another approach has to emerge. We're, we're not in a public debate at all. 
precisely because there's no text in the room, there's no agreement on common terms, and fear and hatred has flooded the landscape where critical thought should be. Indeed, the opposition to gender often involves an opposition to gender studies and to universities where critical thought, so essential to democracies, can thrive. No, we're not in that realm of debate. We are in a phantasmatic scene. And in referring to a phantasmatic scene, I adapt the theoretical formulation of Jean Laplanche for thinking about psychosocial phenomena. For Laplanche, fantasy is not simply the product of the imagination, a wholly subjective reality, but in its most fundamental form, has to be understood as a syntactical arrangement of elements of psychic life. Thus, fantasy is not just a content of the mind, a subliminal reverie, but rather an organization of desire and anxiety that follows certain structural and organizational rules. Much could be said psychoanalytically between, to, um, about the distinction between conscious and unconscious fantasy, and perhaps my interlocutors this evening will address those issues. But here I would simply suggest that the organization or syntax of dreams and fantasy is at once social and psychic. Although Laplanche was interested in infancy and the formation of what he called an original fantasy, I am asking whether we can appropriate some aspects of his view to understand anti-gender as a phantasmatic scene. My wager is that we will be better able to respond to this movement and its discourse by framing the matter this way. For when the scene is set and something called gender is imagined to be acting on children in a harmful way, academics or the public um, uh, uh, are at risk or are themselves involved in destructive activities. At that point, gender substitutes for a complex set of anxieties and becomes an overdetermined site where the fear of destruction gathers. This is where Freud's remark on the structure of dreams converges with Laplanche on the syntax of phantasmatic scenes. It would be a perverse form of flattery to imagine that the contagious and powerful operation of gender um, was generated by gender studies or some of its theories. No. Um, in fact, um, uh, most of the people who are opposed to gender have never read uh, uh, the, the texts that are taught in gender studies. And uh, I once met a woman uh, in Switzerland who came up to me after a talk and said, uh, I pray for you. And I said, well, why, why are you praying for me? She said, you don't accept um, the difference between male and female as stated in the Bible. And I said, um, well, the Bible says some other things. She said, you don't know the Bible. I said, I actually do you know. <laughs> and then she said, it's not naturally in my nature. I said, well, nature admits of diversity. And she was like, no. And then uh, I thought to ask, and I did ask, have you read my work? She said, no, I would never read that work. I wouldn't even touch the book. I wouldn't touch the book. And, I, and then she turned. She said, I pray for you. I realized that the book was the devil. It was part of the devil's nefarious operation. For her to touch that book or to read that book would be open to the input. She'd be trafficking with the devil. She's not going to read that book. Great. We're not in an academic scene of debate, clearly. <laughs> um, what I want to suggest is these anxieties that I've been talking about, these fears of destruction, they are variously bundled into an inflammatory syntax in which some foreign element wields enormous power to destroy social structures as many have known them, the family, nation, civilization, man itself. Consider it as a public phantasm. Gender, the term, the phantasm, I guess we must say, bundles all these issues together 
treats them as a coordinated and concerted movement and ideology, stealing from the left, ideology, and attacks them as a monolith. This bundling operation is what marks the object of their opposition as a phantasm. Here again, we're not just talking about backlash. The opposition to gender is driven by a stronger wish, the restoration of the patriarchal order, where, the, where a father is a father, a sexed identity never changes, women conceived only as born female at birth, assigned, assigned female at birth. We have to correct them a bit, although we won't be called the police if we do. Um, that women resume their natural and moral positions within the household, and white people hold uncontested racial supremacy. I'm not sure that's in the Bible, but it goes along. The project is, by definition, fragile, since the patriarchal order it seeks to restore never quite existed in the form they seek to actualize it in the present. <laughs> the past they seek to restore is a dream, a wish, even a fantasy of a patriarchal ideal that they claim will reinstate order grounded in patriarchal authority. The recruitment of communities into the gender ideology movement is thus an invitation to join a collective dream perhaps we can call it a psychosis, that will put an end to the implacable anxiety and fear that afflict so many people experiencing climate destruction firsthand, or ubiquitous violence and brutal war, or expanding police powers, or intensifying economic precarity. Of course, stoking a desire for a restoration of masculine privilege serves many other forms of power but it does constitute its own social project. Namely, to produce an ideal past whose reanimation will target, if not eliminate, sexual and gender minorities. The shoring up of a phantasmatic promise that an ideal patriarchal, patriarchal order from the past will reappear as the future shape of society as we know it implies the negation of fundamental rights and freedoms of women, gender and sexual minorities, the indigenous, migrants, black and brown people, the disabled and the poor. The restoration dream not only seeks to bring back a rightful place for masculine privilege, conceived as part of a natural or religious order, but in this context, it's an effort to roll back progressive policies and rights efforts to make marriage exclusively heterosexual, to insist whatever sex is assigned at birth stays in place, that abortion becomes restricted because the state knows better what limits should be placed on pregnant people's bodies. The backlash that we see is part of this larger restoration project, and both work in tandem to shore up authoritarian regimes as rightful forms of paternalism, the patriarchal wet dream, true. The fantasy of restoring patriarchal power works as a mobilization technique only if the people to whom the appeal is made have some ready wishes and fears to exploit. The mobilization of anti-gender sentiment by the right depends on the credibility of this dream of the past. No one is providing historical documentation about this patriarchal order that needs to be restored to its rightful place. Nobody is asking for an example of what the world would look like. No, it's an appeal, it's a fantasy, it's a promise, and it's offered in that way and taken in that way. It's not a past that has existed in historical time, even if we can find many instances of patriarchal organization throughout history. This is rather a past that belongs to the dream whose syntax reorders elements of reality in the service of a driving force that does not always make itself easily known. This dream works in waking life only as a phantasmatic organization of reality, one that offers a range of examples and accusations to shore up the political case it wants to make. And as I say, it hardly matters that historical documentation is not supplied, and it hardly matters that the argument that is made is riddled with contradiction. The incoherence and impossibility of the case against gender 
represents contradictory phenomena and even offers its public a way to collect many of its fears and convictions without ever having to make that bundle coherent. Gender represents capitalism, and gender is nothing but Marxism. Gender is a libertarian construct, and gender signals the new wave of totalitarianism. Gender will corrupt the nation like unwanted migrants. It is an unwanted migrant, but also like imperialist powers. Well, which one is it? The contradictory character of the phantasm allows it to contain whatever anxiety or fear that the anti-transgender ideology wishes to stoke for its own purposes without ever having to make any of it cohere. Indeed, the liberation from historical documentation and coherent logic is part of the escalating acceleration that feeds what I would call a fascist frenzy that all too easily rallies around forms of authoritarianism. The phantasm can be found in a wide range of movements against progressive legislation. It arrives on the main agenda of Christian nationalism in Taiwan, the presidential platforms in French elections. It is there in the rallying for a defense of European racial purity, national values, and the natural family in Hungary, but also in the conservative critique of Europe and, and the European Union and its gender mainstreaming policies. Wherever it operates, it brings with it sadistic elation over being freed from new ethical constraints imposed by feminists and LGBTQI plus agendas or their mainstreaming apologists. The anti-gender agenda is buoyed by the excitement of depriving lives of what they require to live, including fundamental and intimate freedoms and access to legal, medical, and educational resources that make life livable. By criminalizing and pathologizing sexual and gender minorities, refusing to recognize the historically shifting character of our embodied and sexual lives, censoring books and policing curricula, the anti-gender ideology movement supports forms of institutional sadism in the name of divine or human morality, warning over the devil, incest, pedophilia, protecting the nation's patriar patriarchal order, that runs from family, from state to family. Remarkable and disturbing is the way that this moral campaign relishes experimenting with various ways of denying the very existence of others, either stripping them of rights or denying their reality, restricting basic freedom, freedoms, engaging in shameless forms of hatred, controlling, variously demeaning, caricaturing, pathologizing, and criminalizing those lives. Hatred is thus stoked and rationalized by moral righteousness, and all those damaged and destroyed by hateful movements prove to be the truer agents of destruction. This projection and reversal structures the phantasmatic scene of gender. This leaves us with an urgent question. Who is actually out to destroy whom? And how do forms of shared and escalating moral sadism pass themselves off as signs of a virtuous order that alone has the power, claims to have the power, to save the world from destruction. In the second part of this paper, let's try to focus on this fundamental question. Why is gender the focus of such anxiety? How did it become such a phantasm? Maybe there's something about gender as an embodied phenomenon, as a way of thinking about embodiment that is linked to fear, anxiety, desire, fantasy, and repression. Okay. On the one hand, I've been suggesting that gender now operates in a contemporary phantas phantasmatic scene. On the other hand, I'm suggesting that gender is always embedded in phantasmatic scenes. <laughs> and that we might consider this to be a psychoanalytic truth confirmed by the contemporary attacks on the phenomenon. In other words, gender didn't just become phantasmatic now. Why would anyone want violently to do away with gender, or rather with the basic freedoms that belong to those for whom gender has been part of the struggle for freedom, a movement toward equality, a stance against violence? 
Maybe if we take a step back to understand how gender emerges in the life of the subject, how it becomes part of its very formation, this will prove helpful. Some time ago, I suggested that gender cannot be understood well, apart from the scene of address in which it emerges. Even the most ardent versions of self-definition imply an audience I identify this way, but I identify this way to you or in front of you, right? So there is, there is some other who's implied always in the scene of my self-identification. In thinking, even we, and, 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 we are aware of this, I think, when we uh, answer the question, who are you, or how do you identify? In thinking about gender as a scene of address, even a problem of translation, I was seeking to adapt La Planche, or La Planche, who describes the infant's confused relationship to the world of adult desire. In his view, the infant registers adult desires as enigmatic. Someone is talking to you, addressing you in a certain way, and that address becomes part of the complex scene of subject formation. I do not immediately become what the other wants me to be, but that adult wanting, what that adult wants of me, is impressed upon me, and I'm left with a quandary that I have to negotiate, an enigma that is mine to live out, but which is not precisely mine to solve. La Planche formulates a question that he, well, attributes to the non-speaking infant, namely, what does the adult world want of me? Right, so he imagines the infant. What does this adult world want of me? Um, and of course, the infant is being gendered through various forms of address at the same time that the meaning of gender, as it first emerges, and maybe as it always emerges, is more or less permanently disturbed. What does gender want of me? Is a question that assumes that gender comes to me first as, a de as an enigmatic demand. It emerges, we might say, from the other, and in some ways never stops coming from the other. And we are more or less young still in relation to that interpolation and may be also more or less confused, asking what is meant and what is wanted. Gender arrives first as what we might call interpolating noise coming from the adult world. And even when its basic instructions, its rules of use, come to be understood and embodied, they're never learned with some un without some unconscious disturbance or resistance. This gender is the effect of whose desire? Is it my desire? How do I know my desire if it is from the start inhabited by the desires of the adults in my world? When we refer to being assigned a sex at birth, as most of us were, then we are already in a scene of interpolation. It makes sense to assume that sex assignment also communicates a set of adult desires and expectations. The infant's future is often being imagined or desired, consciously or unconsciously, through this act of sex assignment. So sex assignment doesn't simply describe anatomical facts. It's already a way of imagining what those, what that anatomy will mean or what it should mean. And that imagining comes from elsewhere. That's somebody else's imagining. And it does not exactly stop after sex has been legally or medically determined at birth. The girl continues to be girled. The boy continues to be boyed. And these practices of girling and boying are repeated not just by parents, but by a range of institutions that greet the child with boxes to be checked and norms to be embodied. In a sense, sex assignment does not happen just once. It is an iterative process, repeated by different actors and institutions. And depending on where one lives, it can be reiterated in ways that are not always in conformity with one another. Sex assignment is not a mechanism, but a process, and it can generate contradictory forms and be derailed by interruptions and challenges. A child can refuse the interpolation temporarily or permanently, and great debates can be had, especially in religious contexts, about what is the right or wrong way to be or to become 
a man or a woman, and whether, alas, those are the only two options. What we rightly call self-definition emerges within this reiterative scene, which is not just about contrasting cultural definitions of gender, um, but the power and limits of self-determination. The problem is not just that adults name a child a certain way or refer to their gender a certain way, but that the words considered as signifiers resonate with what Lacanange called enigmatic signifiers that constitute primary ways of being addressed, primary sites for the incitation of desire, um, and enigmatic ones as well. <laughs> sex assignment, understood as a repeated process, relays a set of desires, if not fantasies, about how one is to live one's body in the world. And the child is addressed with these adult desires with these adult expectations before any possibility of self-definition emerges. And self-definition emerges only in the scene of address in the temporality of iteration. A primary impressionability is assumed in this scene, a way of being profoundly and involuntarily affected by the address of another. Gender arrives first as the desire of the other both one that emanates from the other, however understood, and a desire incited by that expectation, one whose trajectory is far from predictable. That was the most complex part. <laughs> Some would say that the notion of social construction and the social construction of gender in particular implies, oh, we're simply made up of social norms and conventions, Although some claim that construction means, oh, it's all artificial and fake. Both views are, in my view, wrong. They underestimate, among other things, both the disturbance and the unpredictability of the earliest scenes of address in which gender first arrives. An adult's desire is already formed by a series of desire, right? That adult was formed within a matrix of someone else's desire. Um, uh, and that was part of that adult's formation. And to the extent that those desires are bound up with norms, we can say that norms precede us, circulating in the world before they impress themselves upon us. But when norms do impress themselves upon us, and when we register that impress, an affective register is opened. Indeed, the we who would register that impress actually emerges from that scene. If norms can be said to form us, that is only because some proximate, embodied, and involuntary relation to their impress is already there. Norms act upon a sensibility and a susceptibility at the same time that they give form to it. They lead us to feel in certain ways, and those feelings can enter into our thinking even, as we might well end up thinking about them. And although they condition and in some sense form us, they are not effective or predictable. They are not deterministic in their trajectory. Their repeated or iterative logic ends only when life ends, though the life of norms, of discourse more generally, continues on with a tenacity that is quite indifferent to our finitude. The temporality of norms is distinct from the temporality of this or that life. No one arrives in the world separate from a set of norms lying in wait for them. Conventions, modes of address, institutional forms of power, they are already acting prior to any moment when we first feel their impress, prior to the emergence of an I who thinks of itself as deciding who or what one wants to be. Of course, we do sometimes come to break with the norms imposed upon us. We refuse those interpolations that were delivered to us. We find freedom in that no and in that turn toward another path. Nothing of what I'm saying precludes that. And yet, one's formation does not suddenly fall away after certain breaks or ruptures. Those breaks become part of the history we tell about ourselves to show others that such a break can be possible. We say, for instance, that is the moment where I broke with this or that authority or expectation. And in such moments, we understand that how, when, and why I broke is important to the history of myself that I want to tell. 
precisely because the norms that shape me do not just arrive once, but over time and repeatedly. And there are many opportunities to derail their reproduction. Nothing determines me in advance. I'm not formed once and definitively, but continuously or repeatedly. And that process opens up possibilities of revision and refusal and of transformation. I'm never simply formed, nor am I ever unconditionally self-forming. This may be another way of saying that we live in historical time, or that historical time lives in us, um, and, in the, and in whatever form we assume as human creatures. We neither escape the impress that we do not escape the impress that enlivened our desire and made the adult world, including its gendered interpolations, enigmatic. In some ways, the anti-gender ideology movement wants to stop all this freedom. <laughs> and the Vatican has made clear that those who wish to create their own personhood in their own terms are taking over a power that rightfully belongs only to the narrow idea of a Christian God. That intergender movement reacts to the situation of young people seeking to change gender or to gain access to gender-confirming health care or legal status. Perhaps the scene of address that I've been describing can help us to think about these scenes in which the question tends not to be, what does gender want of me, but what do I want of gender? Consider the scene of address in which someone asks you to call them by a pronoun they have not used with you before. Or someone tells you that they are now going by a different pronoun and assumes you will honor their decision. You may be the parent of a child and you've used one pronoun and name for years before this request comes to you to call your child by another name and even another gender. I was wondering how this issue arises for people in a clinical setting. In speaking to someone who announces their new pronoun or asks to be called by a new name, clinicians are generally in the position where they use the second person, they say you, the genderless you, at least in English, which evades, <coughs> solves the problem of that faltering that sometimes happens across the generations, right? She, I mean they, I mean he, I mean, oh God, I got it all wrong. Um, we should ask, what is being asked of you when someone asks you to refer to them now as he, she, or they? What is being asked of parents or teachers by students? And what is the right response? Well, I would suggest that this is an ethical situation in which someone is asking to be recognized in a certain way. And they are asking more specifically for their gender to be recognized. It does not matter how they look to you or what suppositions you may have held about their gender in the past. You are being asked to forego all those and to recognize them with the terms that they have laid out for you. The pronoun change can go along with the change of name, and it can also go along with a legal change of gender status and some medical or surgical changes related to gender affirmation. The social practice is now part of public discourse, but also education which is why dozens of states in the U.S. are trying to ban any such discussion of gender from the classroom. They think that if gender is banned <laughs> from books and conversations, then the practice will stop. Well, good luck. <laughs> Nothing like a ban to get us going. <laughs> For some of us who are older or who live outside of communities where pronoun changes are happening, the new pronoun is difficult to remember or maybe it's a site of ordinary resistance. One thing that is sure, it's a place of stumbling and error. It emerges invariably in a scene of address, so it's also at once a challenge and a question. Will you change? Are you willing to change your relation to me? I'm asking you to change your relationship with me. Do you want to stay where you are, or will you agree to change your relation to me? Will you recognize me as I wish to be recognized? Will you honor my wish? Or will you refuse the terms I give you? Will you refuse my desire? Will you refuse my desire to be regarded and addressed in this way? One feminist parent told me that she'd struggled for a long time to empower her daughter to affirm the freedom and capacities of women 
and that she wanted her daughter to benefit from the feminist struggles that came before. Okay, that's an adult desire that's being imposed on a child. We don't know how that child felt about any of that, okay? She was dismayed that the person she understood to be her daughter asked to be called he and explained that he was in the midst of a gender transition. This parent told me that she felt that her son was either repudiating femininity or suffering from a form of historical presentism, no longer mindful of the history of the feminist movement of which she had been a part. Well, I'm no therapist, but I gave her friendly advice, which was that her child was asking for her, the parent, to offer recognition, even perhaps testing to see whether she would, and that to keep the relationship with that young person, the mother would be wise to offer the recognition that is requested. <laughs> Now, there are many things I don't know about that particular scene. I mean, what kind of relationship did the two of them have? Whether the wish for the child to live out the feminist legacy of the mother was a fundamentally <laughs> narcissistic one, um, one that the child needed to refuse in order not to be engulfed by the mother's feminist narcissism. Um, I have no idea, but I do think that it's probable that that kid felt overburdened by that strong and moral parental expectation. Perhaps as well, it was a way of marking a generational divide. I know many parents feel that to be true. In some cases, the request to be called by a new pronoun is a form of experimentation. Will you do that for me, even if everything in you strains against it? But for trans youth in particular, the pronoun can be the first step in securing a, a new embodied reality, a form of coming out, but also a life or death matter. Perhaps like me, you are young people, or you know young people, who ask for a pronoun only to relinquish it later, or you know young people who ask for a change in pronoun and continue to undergo a gender transition that involved the change in legal status and hormonal or surgical change as well. I know some young people, one in particular, whose rather, I guess, hyper-feminine appearance would probably go uncontested, who suddenly asked to be called they, precisely because they do not want to be reduced to that feminine appearance or the social expectations of who they are that sometimes follow from the perception of femininity. Okay, I am someone who's taking distance from the perception you have of me, I know. For her, for them, they are very classically beautiful as a woman. So to become a they, just to say, do not impose that on me. I know I'm beautiful. Do not, do not make assumptions that this beauty says you know me. You do not. Okay. Um, for parents, as we know, the investments can be very high, sometimes straightforwardly narcissistic, but other times they simply fear losing the child they have known or they fear the discrimination that their child will face. Maybe also they feel rejected by the child's decision to change pronouns or to change the name that the parent gave to that child, refusal of that gift. That means, at least for some of them, that their kid is rejecting the name they gave them and in refusing that gift, that interpolation, they themselves feel rejected. If we think about it, the assignment of sex at birth is usually accompanied by a host of social and imagined expectations about what kind of girl or boy that would be, or for intersex kids, how best to adjust the body to social norms in some way. Sex assignment is often, consciously or unconsciously, an effort to recruit an infant into a gender imaginary, but more, the name and the pronoun carry with them, and from the start, parental desires or the desires of the adult world is what La Planche calls it, because caretakers are not always parents. The originary, in the originary scene of sex assignment, the adult world imposes its fantasies in ways that prove to be not just enigmatic, but overwhelming for the child. Let's consider then, at least, that sex assignment and pronouns have always carried someone else's desire, perhaps not that of a single person, but rather a set of social expectations and norms that are conveyed to a child partially defined by its very susceptibility. Uh, 
If sex assignment carries social expectations and overwhelming fantasies from the other, then it makes sense that over a time a child does not always simply accept the desire of the other as their own desire, does not always reproduce the assignment in the way that it was intended or imagined. In a way, the question, what does gender want of me, is more fundamental than the question, what gender do I want to be? And more fundamental still is the question, will you, powerful adult whose fantasy has deluged me all these years, agree to call me he, she, they, or something altogether different? Maybe the sense of rejection, repudiation, the fear of loss that some parents experience when their child asks to be called by another pronoun or another name has to be thought about in relation to this other, more primary scene, namely sex assignment, its phantasmatic powers, and its iterable trajectory. The anti-gender movement has circulated the idea that sex is a fabrication uh, according to gender ideologists. Unfortunately, some of my feminist allies made the same argument. That gender belongs to a totalitarian regime, that it's a force of destruction that some have made comparable to Ebola or nuclear war. I've suggested to you that we're living through the phantasmatic overdetermination of gender as a term and the displacement of fears and anxieties about the precarious and destructible character of our social and ecological worlds. The fact that gender is called an ideology is an example of the kind of externalization, projection, and inversion of meanings that takes place in this zone of the phantasmatic. And by calling gender an ideological construct or formation, opponents have sought to associate gender with false beliefs that support, again, totalitarianism, state communism, imperialism, etc. Um, it's a powerful, uh, uh, and this, this effort to, I would say, tar gender with all of these possible uh, forms of destruction um, allows the anti-gender ideology movement to become a powerful ideology in its own right, collecting and organizing fears that feed a fascist frenzy that supports increasingly authoritarian regimes. For those on the left who think that gender is a secondary oppression or that feminists should get in line behind the presumptively masculine left, it's time to rethink the coordinates of the contemporary political map. Gender is not just a sidekick for Orban, Putin, or Maloney, or for Bolsonaro, or DeSantis, the emerging power in the US. It's a central rallying point in the defense of national values and even national security. For feminists who think, think that trans rights or that LGBTQIA plus mobilizations are a distraction or a menace, they should, quite frankly, realize that all our struggles are now linked as we seek to overcome the powers that seek to deprive us of basic conditions of livability. There can be no successful struggle against the forces denying women's basic rights without recognizing that these same forces are closing down borders in the name of racist and nationalist ideals and stripping queer and trans people of basic freedoms including the rights of self-determination. The ready definitions for fascism available tend to rely on the study of 20th century fascism. So now new vocabularies are required to understand new forms of fascism that have emerged in the last decade or so. Given the shifting character of economies and new ways of extending militarized forms of power to the police and prison and to the guarding of national borders, we are faced with a combination of neoliberalism and new forms of security that rationalize the destruction of both legal and human rights. Contemporary authoritarians may not themselves be fascists, but they rely on fascist technique and they stoke fascist passions to stay in power. The new authoritarians rail against social movements, including feminism, multiculturalism, and LGBTQIA plus rights and freedoms against civil rights and the protection of the rights of migrants and refugees. 
all of which are cast as eternal enemies or as external ones about to break down the door. Perhaps it is, and I'm almost done here. <laughs> Perhaps it is in the exhilarations of shameless sadism that one finds fascist potentials in the present. All of the contemporary authoritarians promise a liberation from a left feminist gay or trans superego that would affirm trans lives or uh, that exemplify woke culture or that are part of feminist and anti-racist struggles. This shameless attack on progressive social movements unleashed a sense of freedom from the left and an entitlement to privilege um, and power, which in turn demonstrates its triumph by destroying the basic rights of migrants, queers, women, black and brown people, and the indigenous. These authoritarians bolster their public support by destroying any sense of common political belonging in favor of nationalist, racist, patriarchal, and sometimes religious forms of socio-political supremacy, subordination, and dispossession. We find these postures in Trump, Bolsonaro, Orban, Meloni, Erdogan, for, for example, and they are, and some of, some of the Swedish fascists as well, um, and they are, I think, even though they sometimes cite from or hail from 20th century failed fascism, they are engaged in a different kind of fascist exercise. The contemporary fascist trends, ones that engage in death dealing and rights stripping as their major activity in the name of defending family, state, and patriarchal institutions, they are the ones that are supporting forms of authoritarianism. And that is why it makes no sense for gender critical feminists to align with reactionary powers in targeting trans, non-binary, gender queer people. Despite our differences, we have to stay in the struggle, testing our theories about the other by listening and reading, being open to having one's traditional suppositions challenge, and finding ways to build alliances that allow our antagonism not to replicate the destructive cycles that we oppose. For we cannot oppose discrimination against ourselves only to support it when it is against others. We cannot oppose systemic forms of hatred against one group by allying with those who would intensify that hatred in multiple other directions. We cannot censor each other's positions just because we don't want to hear them. It's no time for any of the targets of the anti-gender ideology movement to be petty and divisive or to defend gender studies and the importance of gender to any concept of justice, freedom, and equality is to align with the fight against censorship and fascism. And since fascism emerges over time, we need to know the steps by which it emerges and to identify fascist potentials when they appear. Such a procedure does not imply that fascist potentials materialize as fascist regimes they tend to materialize as authoritarian regimes, but if readiness to resist fascism is imperative, if we are obligated to resist fascism when and where it appears, then we have to identify when and where it is happening, and we have to intensify the resistance to its momentum. In other words, we have to release democratic potentials from our own expanding alliances ones that show we are on the side of life, love, and freedom, making those ideals so compelling that no one can look away. But that will not happen unless we know how to name the true sources of destruction, which include both the destruction of the earth and the freedom to pursue livable life for all of its creatures. Um, um, we have to be able to look at what unrestrained capitalism has done both to workers and to the earth. We have to understand the nationalist alibi that operates in the reproduction of racism. The destruction that anti-gender movements fear is also the one that they themselves now reproduce. And we can stop that reproduction, but only by intervening as an alliance that does not destroy its own bonds that would be to reiterate the logic that we are opposing, or that I am suggesting we should oppose. 
rather releasing radical democratic potentials from our own expanding alliances can show that we are on the side of life, livable life, love and freedom, making those ideals so compelling, so desirable, that desire itself becomes desirable again, and people want to live, and they want others to live in the world that we call the vision. What if we make freedom into the air we together breathe? breathe? For that is the air that belongs to all of us, sustaining our lives, unless, of course, the toxins, and there are many, pervade the atmosphere. Thank you. Thank you.